Ah. <laughs> Come on, you can do better than that. We're here to praise the King. The King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. His name is Jesus. <laughs> Glory be to God who always causes us to triumph in Christ. He always gives you the victory in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. There you go. Hallelujah. We got the youth uh, in, and I can see they're a, a tight group. Amen. You, you guys can sit in the other, on the back side right there. Don't be afraid. You know, amen. Welcome, welcome, Turning Point Fellowship. Every one of you here on YouTube and uh, Turning Point Fellowship here uh, inside of uh, Facebook, right? There you go. Inside of Facebook. Welcome, every one of you guys uh, to our Sunday service. We're excited. We have a guest speaker today. Come on, amen. He's our, he's our family. You know, he's our family, right? Pastor L, you guys know him, right? He does a good word in Jesus' name, so uh, just want to uh, encourage him. You know, when he's preaching, you know, you can say, you say amen. amen. You can raise your hand and say hallelujah. You know what amen means? That means you agree. You may not be living that word. You may not be honoring God in that sense, but you know what? That brother's preaching an amen to me. He's talking to me. Amen. That's, when I go through battles, I still have an Amen. I tell you guys, I come with an amen. I ain't waiting for your amens. I got an amen. Say amen. 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 You know, so uh, some of you guys are loud, you know, right? You're loud people. Yeah. All right, there's one. Amen, at least. <laughs> you guys are loud. You guys can say amen. We can clap our hands in this church here. We can move to the left, to the right, you know. Amen. We got rhythm still. God didn't take away your rhythm, you know, as long as we're not going in and out. Forward and backwards, that's okay. We got to go sideways now, amen? That's the only alteration we have now, but you can uh, give a shout. You can give a, a praise to God. That's what we're here for anyway, to praise God, to bless God, amen? To hear from his word, to hear from the spirit of the living God. So uh, I hope you guys have your hearts open, your minds open to hear what the spirit of God is saying because he's going to speak to every one of us today individually and corporately. He's got a word for you. He wants to talk with you guys. I want to just uh, 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 put this down. We had Jasmine, uh, Romans 8, 38 and 39. I just want to read this to you guys. Because I always talk to you guys about the love of God. Amen? I'm always talking to you about that, you know, so. Because uh, the love of God will change your heart. It'll change your life. God loved me so much that hell had to leave my, my life. I used to live like hell, but God loved me so much that God got rid of a lot of stuff in my life. Anger, jealousy, bitterness, you know, uh, foolish talking. God just begins to heal you through his love. And there's nothing greater than the love of God. He says there's hope, there's faith, and there's love. And the greatest of all is what? That we learn to love one another. He says, love one another as I have loved you. Love one another. He doesn't ask us. He doesn't uh, suggest that to us. God, God commands us to love one another. I'm not called here, Ryan, uh, Raul. I'm not here to like you, brother. I'm here to love you. And you're here to love me. We're not here to like each other. Though that's part of love. It's a little part of it. But if you fall in love with somebody, you can fall in love with a stranger in like 30 seconds, a minute, after you speak to them. I've fallen in love with brothers. and I remember we were getting this church. I spoke to uh, Pastor Jay, the one that was selling us this church. Then when I finished talking to him, he says, can I give you a hug? He goes, I just want to hug you, brother. I said, amen, I want to hug you too. And that's how we should feel when we're in the presence of God. There should be so much love in us and through us and operating for us 
And you should want to love each other. You should want to be giving high fives to each other, smiling, shaking somebody's hand. Somebody walks in, you should be introducing yourself to them. Even if you don't know them, I don't know them. Well, how are you going to get to know them unless you introduce yourself? That's how I got to know you guys, right? I introduced myself to you. I didn't know you guys. But we're getting to know each other, so I just want to encourage you with this word right here. Oh, they have it up. He says, for I am persuaded that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created, uh, thing, uh, created, thing, created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. When you ask God to, for, for forgiveness, God loved on you. And God never stops loving on you. God's love is everlasting. Don't matter if we blow it, or we sin and we miss it, or raise it my hand. God still loves me. I can blow it. And you guys been around pastor, the ones that are real close to me, and you guys, you know, you guys see pastor. But I still love you. And I, I pray that you love me. That's the love of God. And God loves you no matter what you say, no matter what you do. You love your baby girls, right, man? You love your baby, right, girl? No matter what, no matter what, you're going to love her, right? And that's how it should be. You love your babies, right, no matter what. And that's how it should be. Are they spoiled? Yeah, we spoiled them. You know, now we got to straighten that out a little bit. You know, you want to baby, you want to spoil them, but you don't want to make them smell. You know, you know what I'm saying? Like, mm, their attitudes, their animal, their uh, their lives sometimes. But God loves us, and I want you to know that. No matter what you did last night, no matter what you did last week, last month, last year, no matter what you did on the way here, if you ask God right now. Father, forgive me for my sins. Forgive me for my attitude. Forgive me for the way I think. The way I spoke this morning. Forgive me, Lord. He'll forgive you just like that. And in healing, in love, there's healing. There's forgiveness. In love, there's the presence of God. And that's what I want you guys to know and experience the love of God I've experienced his love and I continue to experience it last week you guys saw the move of the spirit of God in this place and it was all about love he loved on us he loved on us and he loved on us and he loved on us and people were crying hugging each other and things like that that's the beauty of God don't be too proud to cry because I know where we come from, our culture. El hombre no llora. The man doesn't cry. That's a lie. That's a lie from our culture. Men cry. Women cry. We're sensitive people now. We're new people in Christ. And thank God for that. Thank God you're sensitive. Because we could have stood ugly, but we made a choice to allow God to love on us and you have to do that you must allow God to love on you you must give him permission and I, I know some of you guys where you guys come from your background like give God permission yes God will not violate your righteous he will not violate with, with, with who you are until you give him permission change my life Lord you got to give him permission change my mind my heart my thoughts some of you still hooked up on certain things, you know. The way we think, the way we live, our sins, our uh, addictions. Our addictions aren't just with drugs. Addictions to attitudes. Addic addictions to patterns of life. You have a pattern and you stay with it no matter what. And you say you're a Christian, but we haven't allowed God to deal with that pattern. That pattern that has been in our life through our grandfather, our grandmother, 
our, our mom and our dad, our aunts and our uncles, and now to our children. And children, you can break these patterns. You have the power and the authority because the greater one lives in you. But you must allow God. Father, love on me. I, I said that 29 years ago. Teach me how to love. I didn't know how to love. My love was perverted. My love was crooked. That's what that means. It was in online with the word of God. And a lot of you still deal with that stuff. Because we judge each other. And that's part of growing up. That we stop judging someone for something. How they look. Some wear makeup, some don't wear makeup, some wear color their hair pink and purple and all that. God loves them right where they're at. They're tall, they're thin. God loves us. And I want you guys to know that right now as we worship God, as we honor God, love on him. Put your focus and your heart on God, not your problems, not your situations. Remove yourself from that. I'm going to think on God. What he's done for you, Art. What he's done for you. Because we come from the same background. What God has done for us. How grateful we should be. Huh, Jessica? Forget about what's happening right now. I'm putting my mind and my heart on God now. And Joe, that's what you're going to do now. Put your heart on God. Forget my problems. Forget who I am. I'm going to lose myself in him. And God's going to heal me through his love. If you really want change, I want change. I need change. I need to change. I don't care. I've been a Christian for 29 years. Valerie, I still need to be changed. And it happens, Andy, through his love. But give him permission. Love on me, Father. Teach me to love. Because you know where you miss it. You know where you miss the love of God. and We should know more. He loves you. Even if you're tired, he loves you. <laughs> Amen. So, Father, we bless you and we thank you for the love. Your love. Your love that covers a multitude of sins, Lord. Your love that is everlasting, oh God. There is nothing and no one that can compare to you and your love. You are love. The Bible says you are love, Lord. And we thank you and we bless you that your love has changed our attitudes, our minds, our souls, our lives. Your love saved us, Lord. Even when we were fighting you and running from you, Lord God, you kept chasing us down. Your love kept chasing us down until you got a hold of us. Today we surrender. We raise our hands and we surrender our spirit, our soul, and our body. Have your way, my Father. Have your say, Lord, we say. Let the words, Father, of our worship and our praise, Lord, be unto you. Let us bow our hearts and bow our minds and our bodies before you, Lord God. I pray, I thank you, I bless you right now. In Jesus' name. And everyone said, amen. Come on, let's bless the Lord.
Lord. Hallelujah. You guys ready to worship? Enter in, enter in, enter in. Come on. Praise His holy name this morning. Let your claps be heard. Let your voice be heard. Open up your heart. Open up your heart. Hallelujah. Release a shout of praise. Release a shout of praise. We serve a mighty and great God.
promise still stands. Your promise still stands. Don't 
stay where you're at. Just stay where you're at. Just breed it in. Just breed it all in. You don't got to clap. Just breed it in. I don't touch you right now. I know you came here to be changed. I know you came here to be loved. I know you came here to be embraced. Just breathe it in, breathe it in. Gracias, Señor. Por tu amor, Señor, por tu amor, tu linda presencia en este día. I'd ask that at this time you just return to your seats quietly. I'd like 
worship to really bring in that spirit, just that peace into the fellowship. Okay, so uh, uh, here's my, my little podcast on giving. I'm going to take you to a, a book you wouldn't think about, but I'm going to tie it all in, so bear with me. Revelation 5, verses 1 to 6. This is what it says. Revelation 5, verses 1 to 6. And I saw in the right hand of him who sat on the throne a scroll written inside and on the backside, sealed with seven seals. Then I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, Who is worthy to open the scroll and to loose the seals? And no one in heaven or on earth or under earth was able to open the scroll or to look at it. So I wept much because no one was found worthy to open and read the scroll or to look at it. But one of the elders said to me, do not weep. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has prevailed to open the scroll and to loose the seven seals. And I, be and I beheld... And in the midst of the throne of the four living creatures, in the midst of the elders, stood a lamb as though it had been slain. What a reminder, huh? We're going to see the Lord, but we're still going to see the marks on him as if he's been slain. So what's going on here? What's happening in this little description? There's a lot of stuff that we can pick up from the Old Testament, but you've got to read it before you can pick up on it. Amen? Jeremiah chapter 32 gives us a description about property ownership and title deeds. And I believe it's really pretty relevant to this. In Jeremiah 32, if you got a title deed to some land, they would take it and they would write on it. And they would write on the deed and then they'd seal it with a seal. And you got the deed. But what happens if you defaulted? You couldn't pay the debt back. If you defaulted, you had to give that deed back. And what they did is they rolled it up, wrote on the back of it with some writing what you owed and what you had to pay, and then they sealed it with seven seals. Now, you got a seven-year grace period. If you can come up with the money in seven years and redeem it, you could have the scroll. You had a right to it. I believe here this is what they're talking about. The title deed that they're talking about here that Jesus takes as a title deed to the planet Earth. What happened? Where was it lost? When Adam, in the Garden of Eden, when he took a bite of that apple, he gave up ownership to the Earth. And who does it belong to? At that point, it transferred over to the devil. And the Lord says, he's the kingdom of this world. But, he didn't factor in the Lord. He didn't factor in Jesus Christ. He didn't factor in the love. Matthew 6, 21. And this is kind of a little bit on your tithing, but, you know, as a pastor, I'm here to remind you. Matthew 6, 21. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Amen? We vote with what, Pastor Angel? Check book. You know, why? Because we put so much value on things around us and little trinkets and stuff. I want to draw your attention to Matthew 13, verse 44. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field, which a man found and he hid. And for joy over it, he goes and sells all that he has and he buys the field. In this parable, a man finds a treasure. And what does he do? He says, I want that field. So he runs out, he buys the field so that he can keep the treasure. Amen? Now, I've heard this parable trot in different ways, but this is the way I believe it. I believe the man is Jesus Christ. And I believe the treasure hidden in the field, the field being this world, is you. Now, how many of us, when we came to the Lord, had to go out and sell everything? get salvation, to follow Jesus. None of us, none of us did that. All we simply had to do was be born again. We had to ask him into our heart. It wasn't by our will. It wasn't by our efforts. It wasn't by our desire. It was totally and completely done by God at the cross. Amen? Amen. He elected us, he predestined us, and he saved us. 
We didn't sell anything to buy anything. The Lord did it all. Now, Jesus gave his life for us. In the, in the, in the parable, the field is the world. And who's the treasure? Come on. The treasure is you. It's me. It's us together. We are the treasure. He purchased the title deed, the one that Adam lost, and he did it with what? He did it with his blood because you're the treasure. Where was his heart? Where was his heart? It was right here with us. Now, Jesus does it because he loves us so much. So what's he trying to do? He wants you to let go of the things that you think are your treasure and focus on him. Okay? Now, really, really hard, but I need that money. If you focus on the world, you're never going to be able to look up and focus on God. Now, am I telling you, yeah, God's broke, you know, dig deep? No. You know what you got to do. He's giving you the ability to make a living. All he's asking in return is 10%. Now, I'm not going to sit up here and twist your arm because if you give it grudgingly, it doesn't work. You got to just go here, Lord. I'll buy one less taco. Now, I say this because all of us that are parents are raising our kids. And sometimes we have to remind the kids what we've done for them so that they can be motivated to give back and grow. And in this little example here, what more could we give? The God that owns the cattle on a thousand fields, every star in the sky, what would he give? All of that? No, he gave his son the most valuable thing that he had. So what does he say? Trust me. Trust me. And when you trust him, what are you doing? You're proving through faith. For your, your faith is proving out your works. Because you're actually saying, Lord, I believe you. Now I'm going to do it. Now here's your opportunity. There's a QR code up there. And you can scan it. If you need an envelope, these gentlemen will be glad to give you an envelope. I want to remind you to go ahead and pray over your gift before you bring it up to the Lord. And just give it to him. Here you go, Lord. This is yours. I'm giving back. As the worship team plays, guys, I want to encourage you to come on up and give.
sing in honor and glory and power be unto the Lamb who sits on the throne. A blessing and honor and glory and power be unto the Lamb who sits on the throne. A blessing and honor and glory and power be unto the Lamb who sits on the throne. A blessing and honor and glory and power be unto the Lamb who sits on the throne. A blessing and honor and glory and power. Did I miss anybody? No more birthdays? Okay, you want to drown me out. You do not want to hear me sing happy birthday. Ready? Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Sandra. Okay. Okay. At this time, uh, the youth are going to stay in today. And uh, the kids, oh, soak it up. All right, let's give them a big hand as the kids go back. All right. 
There's your missionary, there's your teachers, there's your Sunday school workers, the parking lot people are in there. Amen. Amen. Parents, and it, all, it always does me good, parents, you're doing great when I see the kids bringing their tithes and offerings up here because that's exactly how you teach them. That's the key. All right. Worship team, want to thank you. Beautiful music. Pastor. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> Praise the Lord. He want, uh, if we, you want the youth up here or you want the worship team up here? Huh? Oh, it was the worship. Oh, you want the worship team up here. If we can get the worship team back up there, if you don't mind. Thank you, guys. Come on. Amen. I got you guys right now. Hallelujah. Go and have a seat. Have a seat, everybody. Relax. Have your ears open, your heart open to what the Spirit of God is saying. Don't lose heart, Ali. Do not lose heart. For the Lord is with you. What he, what he started in you, he's going to finish it. He's going to complete it. We just have to continue to go. God doesn't quit. He never quits on us. We stop. Don't stop. Keep walking. Even if you get hurt on the way over there. You played sports before. Got hurt while you played, right? Put me back in. Put me back in, Dad. Put me back in, Dad. I remember you when you were a little girl. <laughs> Don't give up. Don't give up on God because God's not going to give up on you, man. I want to uh, I want to recognize uh, we have some cheerleaders in here in the house from Buena Park High School. So... They're, they're supposed to do something. All right. <laughs> I said, they're cheerleaders. They're supposed to go, yeah, coyotes, whatever it's called. You know, whatever you guys are called, coyotes, right? Coyotes. Yeah, the, coy the coyotes for them. But uh, uh, stand up, all three of you, stand up. You too, Mary Jane, you're part of it right now? Okay. They won the championship at, for their district or their league. I don't know what it was for. Amen. Come on, give them a round of applause. Celebrate these young ladies. Hallelujah, amen, yes, you know. Thank God, you know. We'll celebrate a football player, a basketball player. Why not a, a cheerleader? They're having a good time, and it takes, a, it takes a lot of work, right, huh? A lot of practice. What do you guys call flyers, the ones that go up on top? Flyers, you see them at football games. I go watch them, and... They throw these little girls up in the air. Like, the, I know you guys trust God in that same manner. If you trust those people, you better trust God. To, to get caught by them people, you have to catch them. Amen. Uh, uh, so I, I just, that's what I wanted to do was recognize them. You know how we do here at, at a Turning Point Fellowship. We don't tolerate people. We, we celebrate people. We celebrate lives. Amen. Are oh, you guys gonna? Oh, he's gonna. You're gonna be. They're gonna be part of it. Oh, okay, right now you're gonna. You're gonna start dancing and all that. This thing. <laughs> nah, I like to mess with him. Come on, let's welcome Pastor Al up here. Come on, he's our family. Come on, give him a good round of applause. children, uh, where's one of our ushers? You want to go get our children, please, if you don't mind? Thank you, Lord. It's okay, family. We're just going to worship just a little bit more. Ball. We're just throwing a curveball. Got to learn how to hit a curveball. Uh, the same song you guys sang for an offering. The same song you guys sang for an offering. Thank you, Jesus. We're just going to worship. We're just going to praise just a little bit more. 
And we can't get tired of praising and worshiping because we're going to be doing it for eternity, right? I said we're going to be doing it for eternity. So this is good practice. This is what we do when the enemy attacks our family. This is what we do when the enemy tries to attack our mind. This is what we do when the enemy tries to attack our finances. This is what the en- we do when the enemy tries to remind us of who we used to be. We worship and we praise. to know in here that he's not done yet. Until the promise is fulfilled, he's not done. Until what he told you in your heart, what he woke you up at night for you to write down, what he spoke over your children to give you comfort, until that comes to pass, he's not done. Do not settle. We don't serve a God of compromise. We don't serve a God that will take us to the 10-yard line and the game is over. He takes you all the way into the end zone and he makes a two-point conversion. That's the God that we serve. So I don't know who it is who has that family member that's in prison. I don't know who it is who has that child that's out there that the devil has lied and said that they're a lost cause, but God has them. I said, God has them. The Bible says, if you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, you and your household will be saved. The last time I checked, the household is not a physical structure. If you are a mother, if you're a father, if you're a grandfather, if you're a grandmother, and you have children or grandchildren or great-grandchildren, that's a part of your household. They're coming to Jesus. They're coming to Jesus. Listen, don't sell God short. He doesn't need you to get to your children. If he can speak through a donkey to minister to someone who is on a whole nother tip, if he can speak through the mouths of children to minister to a donkey, what makes you think that our God is so small that he can't go ahead and talk to your loved one who's out there in their funk through somebody else? That's the God that we serve. That's the God that we serve. Heavenly Father, I thank you and I praise you, Lord, for this time. At your table. That you've made a family affair, Lord God. Because you love us so. I thank you and I praise you, Father, that my lips will will be like the pen of a ready writer, just speaking the oracles of you, Lord. I thank you for ministering to every single person, specifically what it is they need, Father, from the young to the old, Father, and everything in between. That your glory, Father, that's already here in this place, Father, continues to manifest itself, Father. I thank you, Lord, that as people leave outside of these four walls, Lord, that they begin to get text messages and phone calls, Father, that praise reports they spring out of this, Father. I thank you that joint marrows illnesses, Father, that plague people, Father, that under the power of your anointing, Father, they're quenched because there's nothing that's too hard for you. 
You're still in the miracle working business, Father, and we trust you and we thank you and we honor you this day in the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. team. You guys give it up for the worship team. And family, you can be seated. I count it a, a very a privilege and an honor uh, uh, to be asked by Pastor Angel, the angel of this house, what the Bible calls him in Revelations, senior pastors, the angels of different houses, under shepherd. Um, to be able to minister here as a friend, as an older brother, as an older and seasoned pastor that I look up to. I, I thank you for it. And I thank you guys for uh, preparing your hearts to receive. I know we called a couple of audibles today. We, brought, we kept the youth in and we kept the children in. So I believe that God has something for all of us. Amen. And if you're taking notes, whether it's you were prepared to or you weren't, I want to encourage you, too, there's going to be a few things that you guys want to make sure you write notes on. The title of today's message is, What God Wants for You, Want for Your Children. What God Wants for You, Want for Your Children. There is, and it's been going on for thousands of years, an attack that has been waged against the family and the prize, because the devil's behind the attack, the prize is children, teenagers and youth. Here's the reason why. If the devil can wreck the life of a child or a teenager, he can do damage for a longer period of time than he can to the parents. Parents, I mean, Max, you believe for what the Bible says, 120 years, Right? You know, wherever, you, wherever you, you, your life was changed and you were saved by Jesus, that's great. But if he has a little one, he could go for decades if he messes them up. And so that's the prize. See, I didn't, I didn't like the way that I was raised. I was raised in the church. I didn't like the way that I was raised. But looking now, I'm thankful to my parents I didn't like it, the way that we had to wake up at 5 or 6 in the morning, the way that we had to go through the Psalms and the daily proverb for the day, the way my dad would read a devotional before we went off to school. I didn't like it. I didn't like it so much. There was parts of the Bible, you guys have heard me say this, I didn't read for years. I didn't touch Psalms or Proverbs for years because I, didn't, I was rebelling against what was deposited on the inside of me. But my Bible tells me that... Parents, if you train up a child in the way they should go, when they get old, they won't depart. Just because your child doesn't want to hear that minister that you are being led by the Holy Spirit to listen to in the car, that don't mean nothing. Just because it seems like they are acting out at school, that doesn't mean anything. Because there are seeds that are being sown into them. And when they're old, the Bible is true. They won't depart from it. There's a movie clip. And this was after I actually had prepared for it. And the Spirit of God brought it to my remembrance. I don't know the name of the movie. The actor I know was Tommy Lee Jones. And he walks into a donut shop, it looked like. And he goes to this mob boss and he says, listen. <clears throat> He's very humble. He's like, listen, he says, um, in this brown paper bag, I believe my son owes you money. And he says, I have $15,000 because I want you to release my son. And the mob boss, there's about five guys around the mob boss, and his son is outside. The mob boss, he laughs. He says, what your son owes me, you need to multiply that by about 10 or 20. He says, here's what I'm going to tell you to do with that $15,000. I'm going to tell you to go and buy yourself a, your son a nice pine wood casket because of what I'm going to do to him. The father, after hearing this, he says, okay. And he pulls out a pistol, and he takes out all five of them. And what that just showed me, how many, how many kids do I have in here from kindergarten to 12th grade? Kindergarten to 12th grade. 
some of you guys need to be reminded how much your parents love you. This father, he was willing to go ahead and take care of the debt. And he was going into a den of lions. He was willing to take care of the debt, even if it cost him his life because how much he loved his son. And we're going to learn a little bit later on because sometimes the things that our parents have blessed us with because God has blessed them, we get a spoiled mindset. I'm talking to the children and the youth. And we get entitled. Everybody say entitled. Entitled is when you think that you are deserved or owed something because of who you are. The kid is looking in the car, and he's, he's scared. He's like, Dad, what did you do? He said, I did what I had to do. That's a father's love. If you could turn with me to Genesis chapter 14. If you are in kindergarten to 12th grade, or even if you are college age, could you please stand up real quick? Kindergarten to college age. You're in college. Here's what I want you guys to know. Every time your parents bring you to church, it's because they love God and they love you. And here's what they're trying to do. They're trying to teach and to train you to do the same thing when you have children. That's why they bring you to church. They're they're showing you this is what we do as a family. The only reason, and you guys can have a seat, the only reason why God chose Abraham, or one of the reasons, is because he knew he would train his son and his grandson in the ways that God trained him. In Genesis chapter 14, let me give you the backdrop. There's this guy named Abraham, and what ended up happening was his nephew got kidnapped with a bunch of other people, and these kings are fighting, and they took his nephew And he got involved because that's my family. And the Bible is very clear. Abraham didn't have an army. All he had was a bunch of servants. He had a bunch of servants and employees. And they went up against trained military soldiers. It was all in the power of God. And they beat about five kingdoms. And back then, whoever won the war, you not only won that territory, you actually owned the people. There were hostages. So now this guy, Abraham, who serves God, he has five sets of people, ethnic group, that are under his power. They belong to him. And we have a type and shadow of Jesus and one king named named Melchizedek. And then we have a type of shadow of the devil and another king whose name is the king of Sodom. And in verse 17 of Genesis chapter 14, It says, and the king of Sodom went out to meet him, that's Abraham, at the valley of Sheva, that is the king's valley, and after his return from the defeat of Chedlomar and the kings who were with him. So all these kings whose people had been taken hostage, they're all coming with this king of Sodom. And verse 21, this is what the king of Sodom says. He says, now the king of Sodom said to Abraham, give me the persons and you take the goods for yourself. Some translations say, give me the souls. And you take the possessions. I love what Pastor Joe was saying. He's tiptoeing into my message a little bit. The devil wants us to get so caught up with the stuff that we forget about the souls of our children. And that's for parents and children. Children, if we're so consumed about what's on social media, about the latest gaming console, about this, that, and the other, the shoes, the clothes, the television shows, we will forget to honor our parents. Parents, if we're so busy working to make sure that we have all the nice things, the enemy's like, oh, that's a latchkey kid. Yeah, the parent is in the home, but the parent's not there. There is an agenda by the school system. Let me take a step back because I'm talking about families And some may say, well, L, you don't have children of your own. I've raised children. How I teach, how God has taught me is to teach them like a father. That's how I approach teaching. That's why I'm so passionate against some of the junk that is out there, that is poisoning the minds of of kids so that when they come back, you don't recognize who you sent. 
And it started at the collegiate level, and it trickled down all the way. Now it's at the kindergarten level. But there's something that we can do to disrupt the enemy's plan for our households. In Daniel chapter 1, and I'm just, I'm showing us a little bit of how the enemy's get down has been for thousands of years. Daniel chapter 1, what had happened was this king named Nebuchadnezzar. Now we know Egypt in the Bible is symbolic of the world, the world system. Babylon was also symbolic of the world system. So much so that it pops up in Revelations. So this king named Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, he comes in because God's people have been disobedient. He takes over God's people, but he targets certain individuals. It says in verse 1 of Daniel chapter 1, it says, In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged it. Drop down to verse 3. Then the king instructed Ashpenaz, the master of his eunuchs, to bring some of the children of... Some of the what? You just defeated warriors. So you have... Males that are not warriors, you could join those to your army. You have women that you could take and make them your servants. But the king is coming after the children. Said, takes and some of the children of Israel and some of the king's descendants and some of the nobles. Verse 4, young men in whom there was no blemish but good-looking, gifted in all wisdom, possessing knowledge, and quick to understand, who had the ability to serve in the king's palace. What's going on? The devil wants the children who are children of God, the youth who are children. Listen, he hates everyone. He is an equal opportunity employer. It doesn't matter whether you're saved or you're not saved. He hates people because people are God's heart. But right here... He's like, I just don't want any children. I want the ones that were supposed to be the next king and queen in line. I want the smart ones. I want the ones that actually are educated. The ones that have been coming to Turning Point Fellowship, born and raised. It's a bigger prize. It's a bigger trophy. You drop down. To verse 16, because there was a couple of Hebrew boys that were young men that God had, they already knew what the game plan was. And listen, part of why the king wanted the children to come into his palace was so that they could lose their identity. Young people, if you're in first, second, third, fourth, fifth grade, all the way up to 12th grade, and you're ashamed to tell someone else that you're a Christian, there's a problem. And I'm not talking about being a holy roller, but if someone asks you, hey, do you go to church? And you are like, mm, there's a problem. We're supposed to be in the world, but you can't let the world get in you. Jesus did it. The whole point of him taking the children and bringing them into the palace, number one, to make them comfortable. Number two, I'm going to teach them my language. Number three, if I take them out of their parents' house while I'm raising them in my palace, guess who they'll look at as their daddy? We can be honest. If I took a census right now, the high schoolers, because I've seen it here, how many of their teachers do they hold in higher esteem as a surrogate parent over their own parents? I've seen it happen. And if the teachers walk in integrity, they'll reposition that and be like, no, you got to honor your mom and your dad. Right, amen. I mean, think about it. School's about 6.5 hours, right? That's the chunk of the day that you have a group of individuals. And it's not all of them. But you have a group of individuals that are pouring into your students, into your children. The king wanted to take... He wanted to change their appetite, and on purpose, they were going to eat things that in the law they weren't supposed to eat. You, you guys ever heard the saying, you are what you eat? So these Hebrew boys, these Hebrew young men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, which are their Babylonian names. There's Hananiah, Mishaniah, and I forget the last one. And Daniel, they said, look, we're not going to eat that diet. 
I said, we're not going to, we're not going to, for the sake of time, this is verses uh, 16 through 19. I said, we're not going to eat this food. And at the end of the day, because at the end of the day, all of the young Jewish teenagers and kids had to stand before the king so he could evaluate them. At the end of the day, I think it was like at the end of 30 days or so or a couple of months, they stood and those four shined. Why? Because they hadn't taken in the junk. Their parents, somewhere along the way, had been depositing the word, the word, the word, the word, so that you can recognize. So you can recognize what's real and what's fake. Jesus said in the last days before he comes back, there's going to be a lot of people that are saying that they're him. And here's the thing. They're going to be doing miracles. How do we know who is Jesus and who's not? We know who Jesus is because of the way he's going to be coming. He said in the sky, if you're walking on the ground like me, you're not Jesus. You're not Jesus. People, believers who are not grounded, they'll get caught up by the miraculous, not realizing the devil did that with Moses when Moses threw his staff down and Pharaoh's two magicians threw their staffs down and they both became reptiles. Things are heating up right now. So we have to have a foundation on the inside of us that allows us to stand in boldness, not fear. Some of you parents, you guys have children in your households that are kegs of dynamite for the kingdom of God. They will literally cause revival in their schools and their classrooms. So then, here's my question. Who's lighting the fuse? You're either going to light the fuse or you're going to put water on it. I've known of children that were in elementary that when asked or questioned by an adult said, I am a Christian. This is what I believe. To the point where the adult had to be like, okay, and go on their way and commended them to their parents. You see, our battle, turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 20, it's not against people. I'm not upset at the individuals that the enemy is manipulating and using because they don't know any better. If they knew how much God loved them, then they wouldn't do what they were doing. If we, we just saying about him opening the eyes of our heart. If, if their eyes were open, they wouldn't do it. I'll give you a clue. This is some of the stuff that is happening that some of you may not be aware. I think I shared this. Well, no, I've never shared this story publicly. I was working in administration at the old high school that I worked at, and the kids had to wear a uniform. So one girl uh, was sent in because she was out of uniform, and I was like, go ahead and call your mom. When she dialed her mom's number, the identification, it didn't say mom. You know what it said? It said birth giver. And I looked at her, and she looked at me, and she was embarrassed. Because we both knew that her mom didn't know that that's what she referred to her mom as because of what she was being taught in class. Had another student. She comes in. Call your mom. Same thing. And this is the war that's being waged for the souls of our children. I'm sorry, Ephesians chapter 6, Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12. In Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12, because if you're not careful, you can go ahead and you can get caught up with this side or that side, not realizing that if I abandon this, the word of God, that I'm abandoning the Lord's side. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12, it says, For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. What does that scripture mean? I don't have a problem with humans. I don't care what you believe. I don't have, because I know behind you, if it ain't God, there's only two sides. If it's not God, it's the devil. So then what am I doing? Well, Jesus said I should pray for those who despitefully use me, who curse me. I should bless those to try to do me wrong, am I doing that for my children, my grandchildren's teachers, their principals? Those that do not realize how they're being used by the enemy. 
take a question before that. Are you praying for your children daily? That they're covered by the blood of Jesus. Teenagers and children. So I have news for you. And where's Cherish at? You remember this because we talked about one of your, your teachers. If you feel like you're being picked on in the classroom, chances are it has nothing to do with you but the light of God on the inside of you. And you don't have to tell, listen, you don't have to tell the devil you're a Christian. The devil knows. Like he knows. And sometimes that teacher or those adults that you, or those students that you think are picking, it has nothing to do with you, everything to do with what's on the inside of you because the devil wants to snuff that out. My principal waited, and my principal, she was hardcore. She was like a grandmother to me. She waited until I was out of high school, accepted the call of God on my life. Um, as a matter of fact, this is the Bible she gave me in my ordination. She said, we were driving one time. She said, L, she was like, since you were in high school, I knew that you were called. She said, I knew you were called. See, as crazy as things are in high school, God has agents that are believers in Jesus to look out for your little ones. Youth and children, you guys got to find out. And sometimes you just know on the inside. So the Bible says the same spirit, it will bear witness. Got to find out who those adults are. Sometimes it's that office lady that's just super nice and you don't know why. It's because she's a believer. Sometimes it's that security guard and you don't know why. Whenever you, you get in trouble, you feel like you, it's because they're, they believe in Jesus. And they've been sent on assignment to look out for you. You see, in Proverbs, the book of Proverbs, David is talking to his son. The entire Proverbs, with the exception of the last chapter, David is talking. How many, can I have the father stand up real quick? The father's in the house. Fathers, this is my charge to you. You do the leading so that your counterparts can do the following with the children. In the book of Proverbs, there's 30 chapters of Solomon talking about his dad, David, raising him. The last chapter is a king named Lemuel, and he talks about what his mother told him about how to treat and a view a woman. It's one of the most popular Proverbs. It's Proverbs 31. It talks about a virtuous woman. But there's a reason why 30 chapters is an older father, a man, talking to a younger boy about how to live life. It's never too late. I don't care if they're older, if they got children, it's never too late to deposit. It's never too late. You guys can have a seat. Thank you. It's never too late. Mothers, you got Proverbs 31. If you look at that, if you look at Proverbs 31, mothers, you should be instilling that into your son. There should be no reason why your son brings some female to meet you. And she's not going to be perfect, but she's not exemplifying certain things out of Proverbs 31. And this is not like an indictment against you. It's just sometimes like people feel like the word of God doesn't connect. No, the word of God connects. We ask the Holy Spirit to teach us what to read. Teach us what to understand. This is what I'm going through. Because here's the thing. If Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever, forever is still happening, hasn't happened yet. Which means that when this was written, it becomes a timeless classic. Regardless of the year. Turn with me to Proverbs chapter 22, verse 6, please. You guys are turning there. Now, I'm going to say this three times because I, I, I want us to get this. This is specifically for the parents. It's not the church's job to raise your children in the things of God. I'll say that two more times. It is not the church's job to raise your children in the things of God. I'll tell you what the church's job is because the church does have a job but it's not their job to raise them in this. 
Because if it was, then that means your children are only getting fed spiritually twice a week. You try to eat a snackable twice a week and see how long you go. <laughs> Just try it. Once and twice. Thursday and Sunday. See, see how much weight you lose. When a child is being raised up in the fear of God and by the word, when they come to church, they get spiritually fed. But it's supposed to reinforce what you taught them at home. They should be like, oh, yeah, I know that scripture. Because my dad, my mom, my tia, my tio, my abuelita, my abuelita, they, they, they showed. We went over that. I know that scripture. They should be able to finish the scripture with their teachers. What you're teaching them at home, not only should you be using, but it will become a source that they rely on when they're in sticky situations. I wasn't a perfect teenager, but I knew that when things were going haywire, my parents taught me how to live on my knees in prayer. And it wasn't nothing complicated because all I'm doing is I'm talking to God. And it's funny because Jesus said out of all age groups that the angels of children always see God's face. Well, what is an angel? An angel is a messenger. If I'm talking to God in Jesus' name, that means that when I just come to him with what I have because I'm going through something, he hears me. There's a reason why Jesus said that it would be like a huge stone being tied around a person's neck if they ever messed with a little child, because God takes that seriously. You see, let's go to the scripture. It says, train up a child in the way he should go, she should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. Notice what it says, in the way. Jesus said that I am the way, the truth, and not how you got raised. Not in the culture you came from. Yes, you came out okay, but there were certain things that didn't line up with that. You know what that phrase in the way actually means? It means according to their curve. How many parents just watching the first few years of your children's life, you could see, okay, this, this is what my child is going to, I could see my child gravitating towards this. How many parents have done, have seen that when your child was first born? You could kind of see some of the things they were good at. That's what it means. It means according to their bent. God has put something in each and every one of us. Your child is not supposed to be part two of you. Because there's things you didn't do in your life, so you're trying to vicariously live through them. It don't work that way. And if God doesn't, didn't tell you that, you need to stop it right now in the name of Jesus, because you will mess that child up. I told this story. One of the, he's probably one of the greatest male um, tennis players. His name is Andre Agassi. Just a power. He was probably one of the first faces of Nike. He hated tennis, but he excelled in the sport. He hated it so much because his dad made him play it that when they practiced, he developed his power shot because he wanted to hit the ball over the fence so he wouldn't have to play. So that's how he developed the power shot because his dad forced him. He got good at it, but he hated the sport. You need, and if you don't know, you need to ask God, what is my child supposed to be doing with their life? See, your children, they came from your body, but they don't belong to you. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 20, that we were bought with the price. That's not just the adults. That's the children, too. The children belong to Jesus. You are stewards. The same thing that you guys hear during offering. The money doesn't belong to you. It belongs to God. But it comes through you to see what will you do with something that's not yours. Because Jesus is very clear in Revelations. When we get up to heaven, we get our own stuff. We get our mansion. We get the things and the desire. But right now, this belongs to him. Are you a good account manager? Are you an unfaithful steward? Money, clothes, cars. Some of us believe God for cars saying, Lord, you bless me with the car. I'll make sure that I carpool, take people to church. Lord, if you bless me with this extra cast, I'm going to double up on my giving.
I'm going to name some parents in the Bible. And you guys can write these names down. You can read their story. And the reason why I'm saying the names of these parents is because they knew the assignment. There's like this new little hip phrase, so-and-so, they know the assignment. That means when you go and you accomplish what you're supposed to do. This woman named Hannah, who had a son whose name was Samuel, she knew her son's assignment because she kept her word with God. She said, God, if you bless me with a child, he's yours. He can go into ministry. She was faithful. She got seven more kids after him. And she didn't wait till he was like 17 and a half, about to turn 18. No. Bible says as soon as he was weaned, as soon as he could eat regular food, boom, he was in the house of the Lord serving the priests. A couple by the name of Jacob and Rachel, who were Joseph's parents. Jacob was the grandson of Abraham. They knew the assignment as far as getting the word of God into Joseph. How do we know that? But because when he was a teenager and he's in Egypt and he has all these temptations, he says as a teenager, I can't sin against God. Nobody's watching. My mom and my dad are not here, but I can't sin against God. My boss's wife is making passes at me, but I can't sin against God. This guy named Zacharias and Elizabeth, who were relatives of Jesus. Elizabeth was a relative of Jesus. They knew the assignment. And Zacharias almost did. He started to do what I talked about. Angel comes to them. They haven't had any children. They're in their old age. Which to my older believers is an encouragement because you're not finished your assignment. You don't age out of being a Christian or have an impact. If you got grandchildren, you got nieces and nephews, get busy. If nothing else, interceding for them. The angel tells Zacharias, hey, your son is going to be the one to, to prepare the way for Jesus, and you need to name him John. Zacharias is like, nah, we don't do that in my family. Everybody's name is Zacharias. We don't even got, we don't have no Johns. The angel is like, yeah, we got to shut your mouth because you're going to get in the way of the promise. It took nine months. They brought a tablet to him. They were like, what's his name? He put John. Immediately his mouth was open. But they knew the assignment. He recognized that this kid is going to be different. Mary and Joseph, they knew the assignment when it came to their son, Jesus, their stepson, Jesus, for Joseph. Abraham and Sarah, they knew the assignment when it came for Isaac. There was a certain way that Isaac got down. When he was an adult, and he got that from his father. The last one, Manoah and his wife, who were the children of Samson, and they're really a great example because Samson rebelled. He backslid. It wasn't until the last part of his life, this is, goes back to that scripture, train up a child in the way he It wasn't until he was in chains up against the pillar that all the things that his parents had put on the inside of him came up. He said, God, you're still with me. Forgive me for what I've done. And now, God, give me strength one more time, and I need to go ahead and take out your enemies. And it said that when he pushed the pillars, he killed, because he was in a, a, a demonic temple of the Philistines, he killed more Philistines than he had in his lifetime. And for reference, he killed 1,000 Philistines with the jawbone of a donkey. One fight. Uh, Artie, can you stand up, please? Artie Jr., can you, Margarita, can you stand up? And um, Sister Olivia, can you stand up? This man back here, when the enemy messes with his family, he goes bonkers spiritually. He reminds the devil that the blood of Jesus covers his family. He reminds the devil that it's hands off of his family. This couple right here, God dropped it into her heart. And she gathers all of her grandchildren, at least once a week, right, to do devotion. That's not by chance, especially in the times that we're living in. This young lady right here, because she didn't give up on what God put on the inside of her heart, This man right here is serving God and ministering to the youth. You guys can have a seat. 
What am I saying? There is a trickle effect when we're obedient with our family. There's a trickle effect. Listen, if God puts it in your heart to speak to someone else's child, we're all a part of the family of God. And I'm not talking about to harass them. I'm not talking about being critical. But to lovingly correct them. How does God deal with us when we mess it? How does God bring us close? The Bible says that it's love that draws the sinner to repentance. Last time that I checked, we have to get very good at what we speak over ourselves. So how do we do devotion? Does it need to be our religious instructor? No, I don't think so. But at least one time a day, even if it's five or ten minutes, you and your children or whoever you're responsible for, you guys need to be looking at something from the word of God. There needs to be a discussion going on. The same way God is real to you, he has to be real to them. And trust, in the beginning, they're going to be bucking it a little bit, but we can't be dissuaded. Was God dissuaded with his love towards us? Some of us, God chased us for years. You take a scripture, a devotional, whatever is ministered to you, you ask the Holy Spirit, how can I break this down to my kids? How can I break this down to my teenagers to meet them where they're at? You have to ask the Holy Spirit how to make it relevant. You have to pray with them. See, we know how to pray. But if it came down to it and something happened, could we with full confidence say with our children there, God forbid, that I know that they would be able to go to God on my behalf? Could we say that? Like they'd be able to take it into prayer, like in the name of Jesus, right? Could they do that? Did we train them? Did we prepare them? I played sports. Coach was very clear. He was like, if we don't go over a play, we don't go over a scenario, that's not on you guys. That's on me. But if we run a drill and you guys just start deciding to go willy-nilly or y'all want to go ahead and start playing like a school y'all ball, that's on you because you were trained. We drilled it. And you will pay the consequences for it. They have to see us developing godly habits of him in our lives. And it doesn't have to just be the husband, husband, and wives. You guys can take turns. Your sons need to see a strong man of God getting into the word. Your daughters need to see a strong woman of God getting into the word. And both need to see that so they know what to recognize when it's their time to create a family. And they don't settle for the okie doke. I'm sorry, y'all gave me 10 minutes like a while ago, huh? All right, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to land this plane. These are the last things that I'm going to say. Proverbs 18.21 is very clear about death and life being in the power of the tongue. You see, we don't raise our kids the way we were raised. We raise them the way God has raised us. You got to go back because you're not the same person you were when you got saved. How did God lovingly get you to mature? How did God get you to go? That's how you raise your kids. So there's a couple of things, parents, that we got to get very good at. And you can write these down. They go a little bit fast, but there's a recording for this, right? Number one, I love you. Your children should be hearing that over excessively. The young men that I mentor, that their fathers are not there, I make sure that they hear that. And this is no mark against my father, but I didn't hear that from my dad until I was 18. It was because we were in a workshop. But I knew my dad loved me because I, I saw the things that he did to provide for me. But it's something about hearing that. There's a reason why God's name is love. That's who love is, God. So parents, they need to hear us say, I love you. They need to hear us say, I'm sorry. It's my fault. Adults that are grown up who can't take responsibility have never been taught how to by the ones that were over them. They need to be able to hear, I'll do better from you. When you make a mistake, you should be able to tell your child, I'll do better. Because you will, by faith. They need to hear, I believe in you. You can do this. Listen, they hear from their teachers at school. They do. 
That's like part of our teacher training. There's actually an educational ratio that they have teachers do. Before we can correct a child, we should have at least given them three positive reinforcements. Like that's how they train us as teachers. It's a ratio of three to one. They need to be able to hear, we'll do this together. I'm not mad at you. I'm disappointed. When you say I'm disappointed, you separate the kid from the action. And what is disappointment? We had an appointment for you to do things a certain way, and you broke it. You broke, that's what disappointment is. Well, you break an appointment. I'm pleased with you, and I'm proud of you. They need to hear that. They need to hear it from you. Because if not, they'll seek the validation from somewhere else. Things that we need to get out of our vocabulary when we're talking to our kids. You're a bad kid. Here's the reality. If you're going to punish them for being bad, then you're the one who looks crazy. Because they're being what you call them to be. I, listen, I'm not going to go home and throw a brick at my dog because he's a dog. I call him a dog. He's a dog. He's doing doggy things. So why would I punish him? No, 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 no. What you did is bad. You're not bad. Separate the kid from the action. That's what God does with us. He doesn't see an alcoholic. He sees this child who went down and did alcoholic things, but he don't see an alcoholic. He sees a child because he looks at us through the eyes of Jesus. We need to stop saying that they are they're dumb or stupid. We need to, this is a big one. Do you want to end up like me? If we could hear some of their thoughts, they'll be like, nah, uh-uh. Like, if you could hear, when you ask them that question, if you had a microphone tuned up to their mind, I'm like, nah, uh-uh, not really. Okay? We, we need to, because what are we doing? We're pronouncing things over them. Children, you guys aren't off the hook. Children and youth. And Pastor Joe was hitting on it. He started to get, you need to start telling your parents thank you. And not when they do something for you. You can tell them thank you just because you're here. I mean, my God. Like, if nothing else, you can tell your parents thank you. You need to let them know that I love you. You need to tell your parents I appreciate you. If you knew what your parents had to go through at work, some of you guys would be a little bit cautious about asking the things that you do. Some of the junk they have to deal with because they want to provide the best for you. You need to let them know, mom and dad, can I help you? You need to. You're a good parent. You see, it's not manipulation. What it is is it's appreciation. It's appreciation. You're appreciating them for them loving on you both ways. If you would all stand with me, we're going to close. You know, Malachi chapter 4, verse 6, it talks about in the last days. Jesus actually, he, he requoted Malachi chapter 4, verse 6, and he talked about when he came on the scene, he would change the hearts of the fathers towards the children and the hearts of the children towards the father. So parents, families, children, youth, I'm going to lead you guys in a declaration. What I need you guys to do is, and it could be three generations. Maybe you have your grandkids here. I need you guys to be able to face each other. So I'm going to give you guys some time to face each other, the children and the families. The parents, you facing your children, your grandchildren. If you're not sitting next to your parent, go find your parent. And if your child isn't here, you can still declare it over them in faith. Bible said that he sent his word and healed them, which means that he and them were in two separate locations. So the word of God doesn't know any bounds, doesn't know any space. Parents, you guys will go first. And parents, if you can face your children, go ahead and repeat this after me. Oh, we got some more children coming in? Okay. All right. Parents, make sure that you're saying this to your children. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. This is what it's about. It's about family. All right. Okay, parents, you first. You can repeat this after me. I love you. I'm sorry if I've hurt you. If I haven't listened to you. If I haven't done my best. Please forgive me. But we're going to do this together. 
as a family. I'm going to teach you and train you in the ways of the Lord. How to have a real relationship with him. So that he's alive in you. Because he lives in you. And as for me and my household, we will serve the Lord in the name of Jesus and with God's help. In the name of Jesus, amen. Now, children, you're going to say this to your parents. Go ahead. You get your love on. You get your hug on. Children, you're going to say this to your parents. You'll repeat this after me. I love you. And I'm sorry when I haven't done my best, when I disappointed you or disobeyed you, please forgive me. I'm going to do better. I need help. I'm going to encourage you and pray for you and allow you to raise me. As God shows you, teach me. I'm ready and willing to learn. I love you. In the name of Jesus, amen. You guys can go ahead and have a seat. Heavenly Father, I just thank you and I praise you, Lord, for this time, this family feast, this time of reconciliation, this time of healing, this time of, <laughs> of mending gaps and chasms that the enemy was trying to go ahead and cause in families and division. I thank you, Father, that there's nothing like your loving power that destroys any burden, that breaks any yoke, that protects, that shows, that provides, that teaches. Heavenly Father, let the things that we said today, the things that we learned, let them stay within our hearts. Let them stay within our spirits, Father. And let us go forth and do them in the power and the strength of you. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Okay. Hallelujah. I, I met Pastor uh, L. I, I can't pronounce his name. Say your name, you know. Alagosa. Alagosa. Okay, you got, yeah, Alagosa. There it is right there. It's a Latino name. <laughs> is it? Oh, okay. Yeah, amen. He's Nigerian, though, right? Yeah, that's why they're always late, just like Mex. <laughs> they're just like Mexicans, always late, man. Do you guys know what time church starts? Nine. Yeah. <laughs> Hallelujah. Go ahead, have a seat. Have a seat, guys. It's a beautiful word. So it was a word that was right on time. You know, some of you brought your sons here, your daughters here, your grandchildren here. God gave us a lesson. Amen. You know, we can always learn no matter how old we are. We can be in our 60s, 70s, 50s, 40s, 30s. It doesn't matter. You can learn. You can be 10 years old. You can be 8 years old. You can learn. You just allow the Spirit of God to speak to you like he did to us today. He spoke to us. We needed that. Turning Point family, we needed that. Amen. Amen. And uh, us parents, we needed that. And you needed it from us. Amen. It's, it's a beautiful thing. I love to be challenged by the Word of God. I really do. I really do. I don't get all offended by no word or anything like that. Just it hurts, but it's good. You know, I love the word. I want to. I want to bless my brother right here. You know, uh, I know he's part of our family. He's part of our church. He's always here. Uh, he's with us. He's not against us. He's part of us. He speaks into you guys' lives. He does. He's a teacher in the high school uh, area of of, of life. And he does counseling, and he does a lot of, uh, what's it called again? Not just tutoring, yes. He does tutoring. 
And he doesn't just teach you guys knowledge. He teaches them the knowledge of the word of God, too, as he does it, you know, for some of you that know him, you know. But uh, if you guys get the, the buckets and everything, if you need an envelope, uh, get you an envelope, you know, in Jesus' name. Put up the, uh, the phone number. Give it the phone number and the QR. Let me have a... Always give me an envelope, guys, please. All right. Uh, it's not about the tithing or offering. It's an offering. It's a free will offering, what the Bible calls a free will offering, meaning it comes from the heart. No one's forcing you. No one's making you do anything. No one in this church will make you ever tithe or give. You give because you love the Lord. You're doing this because... This is how the man, he lives. You know, uh, yes, he works. But he does this here to, to be a blessing. And now we want to be a blessing back. God has blessed us to be a blessing. Amen. And we live by faith and not by sight. When we give, we give by faith. It, you know what? He's going he's gonna to impact many, many Christian children in their lives. As well as you will as a parent. My prayer when we started this church is that they would remember you, your children would remember the parents and the uh, Sunday school teachers more than they would the high school football coach, more than they would someone that did them wrong, that they would remember their parents and the Sunday school teachers here more than anybody. When they're old, they'll remember. I remember nuns. I don't remember their names, but I remember. When I was going to the Catholic church growing up, they were nuns. And they taught us the word of God. And from there, we went to where God led us. But they were the foundation. You know, we look down sometimes at, at that church, but we shouldn't. Because that's where we started our baby steps. And we went on to now to a greater knowledge. Same thing here with this young man. I call him a young man because... I'm much younger, older than him. I'm much younger. <laughs> I'm much older than, than he is. But it's time to give into his life. And I can't tell you what it is. Only God knows in your heart what you want to give. Whatever God has dropped in his heart, in your heart to give to him, give to him. It's seed. You know, and it may, he may not speak to your grandchildren or to your nieces and nephews, but someone else will. Because you put that seed of life out there. And that seed of life is going to give fruit. And the children are going to be able to eat of it and, and live their lives. Happy lives. Right, man? Happy lives. I see what God is doing in your life. Steph. All, you're all different now. It's all different. And I praise God for that. Sadness is leaving you. Anger is leaving you. Bitterness is not going to be part of your life. It is not. What the Lord's going to do is going to restore. He's already reconciled you back to himself. You belong to him and he belongs to you. Now he's going to begin to restore your life. Better than before. Not the same it was. Better. Your life is going to grow. You're going to be a mighty woman of God. All these nephews and nieces here, and I said, man, Thea, God did something. Amen. But give, guys. Give out of your hearts. Pray over it. Drop it in the buckets right there before you come and give it in Jesus' name. We'll, we'll uh, cut a check out for him, and uh, we're going to bless him in Jesus' name, guys.
want to I want you guys to teach I want to teach this real quick with you guys that just know the anointing of God. The anointing is the spirit of God. And it's uh it's it's a taught it's and the Bible teaches us about the oil. It is a like I don't know the word, but it's an example of the spirit of God. When we lay it's a what? Yeah, a reputation of a of of the spirit of God, the, the oil. So that's why they anoint you with the oil, because they're anointing you, they're dropping in you the spirit of God. It's not the oil that does it. It's the spirit of God that does it. And I want you guys to recognize that because our young people are here, our children and our youth, that how, so, how quick you can tap in. Because this house is insaturated with the spirit of God. You know, we're not, oh, Father, we thank you that we, you know, that you're in our presence. No, thank God we're in his presence. And that's wherever you go, God. So you can tap into God anytime. He's already with you. But if you just want to say, I'm tapping in, you know, like the wrestlers did right in the days, they tapped in to get in. Tap in to get in. And you'll be blessed by God. It's not about money or nothing like that. I want to be a blessing to this young man. I met you back uh, in Santa Fe Springs, huh? Yeah, I met him back, that's about, about six, six years ago. Funeral? So I was like, maybe about 220, 219. And he became my friend. We were a kindred spirit. He's one of those kindred spirits that I know that is, he's assigned to my life and I'm assigned to his life. I know that. You know. Uh, but the anointing of God is right here, guys. And some of you guys that if you don't have to move, don't move. Some of you guys just move for no reason. You have to go to the restroom, really don't have to go to the restroom. You can hold it. That's the way I was taught. And the Spirit of God taught me a lot. I didn't, not, not taught by men. I was taught by God. But just learn to be still in the presence of God. There's a lot of people that think they have to fix their hair and start looking at their makeup and all that stuff. You don't have to do that. Just be, be still in front of the Lord. And let him minister to you. Be still before him. Because he wants to bless you. We're going to pray for this, then we're going to pray for a friend of our church. He doesn't come here, but we're going to pray for him anyway. He's a believer. But right now, let's pray for this right here, for this offering in Jesus' name. If you want to come right here for me, please. Both of you guys just come on the side. Lift that up. Father, I thank you and I bless you for this offering. As we offer it up to you, Father, we offer it up with open hearts, open minds, Lord God, open spirits. We know that this represents seed, the seed of life, your word. For in your word, there is spirit and there is life in your word. And we thank you, Father, for the blessings upon Alagosis, Lord, upon his life. I say he'll live long, he'll live healthy, he'll live joyful. He'll fulfill the purpose that God has given him in his life to preach the gospel of Christ, to live in joy, to encourage others, Lord God. To speak to those young people, Father, those things that be not as if they were, Lord that he would speak over their lives, not just teach them the knowledge of math or 
English or language, Lord, or history, but of who you are. Somehow, some way, you'll give them the tack, the words, the actions, the witness. As you anoint him, Father, further and deeper, I thank you for this young man's life. Thank you for this offering as we give it, Father, as a family, as a corporate, as a church. We all give it, Lord. Even the ones that couldn't give or didn't give or chose not to give, Lord God. We gave. Unto your servant, Lord God. So we ask that you bless this house as we bless him, Father, with this gift. We thank you, we offer you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. What is Jerry's last name? Flores? Uh, it's Adriana's brother. Sarah's brother. Uh, he just got hit with an attack. And uh, he's in the hospital. He's in... Uh, what do they call it? So, yeah, he's in a dangerous place. But right now we know that the word of God says there's no weapon, no weapon that's formed to be used against us that will prosper. Any word that rises up in judgment shall and will be condemned. For this is our, our inheritance. Thus says the Lord of God. So we have to know that. That God turned it around. And he's turned it around for many of us here in our lives and our families. Many. We're going to believe this right now for Jerry. Jerry Flores, his name is Gerardo, his real name, right? Yeah, Gerardo is his real name, his Spanish name, Mexican name. Uh, so we're going to pray over him. And I want you guys to pray too. That God touch him. Touch those doctors right now, Father. That you would use these doctors, Father, in their highest capacity that they have, Father, through you, Lord God. Even if they don't even know it's through you, but they would recognize, Father, that the science, the medical, Father, is all through you for all good gifts come from above. So I thank you for Jerry's life right now, Lord. We call health to his mind, to his soul, to his body, Lord God. A wholeness, a wellness, Lord, that by the stripes of Christ, we declare that Jerry would be healed in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Lord God, that he would be well, that his, his parents would be well and at peace. They would be encouraged, Father, by the word that lives within them. The word that you, Father, would remind them that lives within them, Lord. I thank you and I bless you for his brothers, his sisters, Lord God. That great is their peace and great is their composure right now. That you are with them always. You said you would never leave us nor forsake us, even in that I see you where he's at right now, Lord God, in that surgery room, Father. You're there with him. I thank you that you would touch him, Father. You send the angels right now to minister to him. Jesus, Holy Spirit of the living God, I ask that you would go. Just lay hands on him, Lord. And that he would know and he would recognize you touched him. And you touched him and you made him whole, Father. We ask for this, Lord God, right now. As we join our faith together in one. In the mind of Christ and in the spirit of the living God, Jesus, your spirit. We thank you. We bless you, Father. In Jesus' name. And all of us said as one. Amen. 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 Hallelujah. <laughs> Praise the Lord.
Go up and say hi to Pastor L, man. Tell him a good word what he gave you, if he, as he blessed you. Amen. And, uh, shake someone's hand. Before we leave, is there any first-time visitors here? Any first-time visitors? <laughs>